I'm John Mather. All right, and what are you an expert in? Well, I like to build telescopes, so I work for NASA. All and right. we're working on the James Webb Space Telescope. All right, and are we alone in the universe? How would I know? All right. <laughs> so we, we have so far not discovered our neighbors yet. Uh -huh. uh, we imagine as scientists that they may be out there. Uh, we've been working for many, many years to try to guess how far away the neighbors might be. Uh, I'll give you my opinion. Go ahead. I think that uh, there are many planets out there that are a bit like Earth. Uh, the ones that are exactly like Earth in the sense of having the capability to support life like we know it, probably much more uncommon. Uh, and um, the possibility exists, certainly, that there's life out there. Uh, I think it's likely that the neighbors are quite far away. Uh, if by neighbors you mean uh, an advanced civilization having a conversation about advanced civilization. Um, if you just want to know, are there microbes out there? I think they're much more common. All right, so common microbes and te technological intelligence, not so common. How far away? I mean, outside our galaxy, for example? I'm guessing that the uh, nearest microbes might even be in the solar system. Okay. So we have a few places that we know are wet, mm -hmm. uh, such as the uh, oceans under the ice on the moons of Jupiter, um, probably under the, on the oceans under the ice on the moons of Saturn because uh, we've seen water coming out from those places. Mm. Uh, Mars was wet some time not so long, very long ago, uh, and there are places that may still be wet enough underground where uh, my life might exist now. So that's my guess that there are microbes nearby that we could actually discover and measure and bring home within our lifetimes. Is the question, are we alone, an important question? Mm, interesting thought. So what would you do with it if you knew the answer? That's one way of asking the importance. So philosophically, people would want to know, are we alone? Because we have invested a vast amount of effort in our philosophy and religions over many thousands of years to try to understand that question of how important are we? And so we like to think that we are the pinnacle of everything here on planet Earth. Uh, and um, it might change our opinion if we knew there was life elsewhere. Yes, it would, would I guess another revolution in humility. Yeah, that might be. So, um, well, humility and also perspective. Do you um, think humanity yeah. needs another revolution in humility and perspective? Uh, I don't know whether we need it. I think we might get it. <laughs> I think we uh, have two kinds of humility that we need. One is uh, that we need to understand that if we're going to live here very long, we have to protect the world that we live in. Uh, and uh, we are now the apex predator, and which means we are the enemy as well as the friend. Mm -hmm. So uh, we have to deal with ourselves as the, as the uh, world-changing organism that we are. What part of your research is relevant to answering the question, are we alone? Well, I've certainly worked on the star, uh, start of the universe question, the history of cosmology. Where did the galaxies come from? Uh, what was the Big Bang like? And so I've worked on that. Uh, that's what we got some recognition for in the Nobel Prize. Uh, most recently, I've been working on the James Webb Space Telescope, which is a telescope intended to um, find out a lot more information about the growth of galaxies, the formation of stars, and even the histories of planets. So we think we'll be able to observe planets around other stars through the transit techniques. Um, some starlight goes through the atmosphere of a planet on its way to our telescope. Mm -hmm. So we can see if any of them show signs of being like Earth. Uh, I don't know what we'll find, but that's the next question. Uh, after that, I'm interested in, uh, can we see the planets directly? So I've been working on a new concept uh, to put up a star shade to catch a shadow of a star on a telescope here on the ground. And if you could do that, then you'd be able to say, I see the little dot over there, that's like Earth or not. Mm -hmm. And to try to understand its chemistry and temperature and properties and does it spin like Earth? Does it have seasons? Does it have continents? Does it have clouds and oceans? Mm -hmm. All those things you'd love to know about another planet way around another star. So that's a current idea, and it's a really difficult idea, but it might be still the best thing that we have to try. Some people think that the universe is spatially infinite. The, the data seems to be consistent with that. Do you think that means that there are an infinite number of John Mathers in the universe saying the exact same things that you're saying now? I think not. I think the mathematicians would tell you, if you ask them the right question, that it's not like, likely. Um, there are different categories of infinity. Uh, I don't know how many students know that, but there's just to recite the first few, uh, there's the number of integers. 
which turns out to be equal to the number of integer fractions. Mm -hmm. uh, then there is a larger number called the number of real numbers. Mm -hmm. There are many more real numbers than there are integers, and you cannot make a list of the, the real numbers. Then there's a larger number than that, which is the number of functions of real numbers. Mm -hmm. And that's the third infinity that's bigger than the first two. Mm -hmm. So uh, when you say, I've got an infinite volume of space and time, you cannot say, therefore, there's another me. But in cosmology, we usually talk about, we throw around this word infinite. And I guess most people would, I guess, that they would use infinite in the sense of the first one that you mentioned, the, you know, one, two, three, four, five, in, countably infinite. Mm -hmm. And I guess in terms of space, I guess there must be some way of an isomorphically projecting a countably infinite onto space. Or I guess you could say it's a real number. Yeah, well, so the space and time are four-dimensional and uh, describable by real numbers. So that's the infinity of real numbers. Um, so, so wait, does that, that, mean a, wait, that means they're infinitely divisible? Because real numbers are infinitely divisible, oh, but yeah. some people say there's a smallest aspect of space, for example, the Planck time. Yeah, Planck's so we don't know about the smallest aspect of space, but at least uh, to first approximation, the number of uh, uh, points in space-time is, is the infinity of real numbers. Wait, why is that? Why not the count, countably infinite? Yeah, because I take a Planck, uh, Planck time in space, honestly, Planck time in space, Planck time, and I divide the universe into Planck size cubes. Well, that maybe, would be maybe countable. You could, right? Maybe you could do that. Maybe that would be countable, which would be a smaller version of infinity. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Um, but I think that the number of, uh, of of trajectories that produce a John Mather that's more like the number of functions on uh -huh. a real manifold, and it's much larger than the uh, than the number of points in the manifold. So. That means that uh, the fact that I exist as one trajectory in space-time of some function does not mean that there's another one just like me so out there. You're, so you, I think what you're saying is that John Mather is a set of measure zero. I think so. 